So, title, Alejandro. This work was done in collaboration with uh, Rodrigo Acuña, and we both worked together at the Innovation and, and Research Division of the Amadeus IT Group in France. So, this is just an outline of my presentation. So, I'm going to start with a brief introduction where I discussed uh, what I explained the problems that we're trying to solve. Then, I'm going to go briefly through what is the, the typical solution used in the travel industry, at least, and in other industries, which is called the discrete choice model. And then I'm going to talk about what we propose, how to improve this uh, using deep learning, and in particular, what is called the uh, pointer networks. And then I'm going to talk about the, the data that we use for the validation, which is the uh, real uh, bookings and search logs. And I'm going to show some results where we compare our method against uh, the typical model, which is called MNL, and also a machine learning based methods and some heuristics, and then just uh, wrap it up with some conclusions. So just to get started. So the problem that we're trying to solve is the same in my case. I want to travel to KDD, right? So I live in France, in Nice. So I look for a flight from Nice, France, to Halifax for these given dates, right? So I will be presented with different alternatives. And uh, I will choose one. I will buy it. Now, in, in our case, in the case of Amadeus, what we try to, to the problem we're trying to solve is giving a flight search request, which of the alternatives is most likely going to be selected or bought, right? So maybe it will be the cheapest one, or the one with the least connection time, or the fastest, or so on. So of course, being able to predict this has many applications in the industry. So the, the most common one is to, for example, filter or sorting these alternatives on a website. But it can also be used for other like airline applications, like, such as the revenue management and the price optimization. And uh, historically, in the industry, it has been tackled using what is called the discrete choice model, which is going to be here. So in the discrete choice model framework, there are three main, uh, let's say, basic components. So we have the decision maker, so the person looking for the flight. We have the, the set of alternatives from which he has to choose, and the final choice, which is only one. In our case, the booking, right? So a little bit more formally, faced with a finite set of alternatives, the decision maker will choose one based on the attributes of both the alternatives and of himself. And he will obtain a certain utility, let's call it benefit, uh, from choosing each one of these. And the idea is that he will choose the one that gives him more benefit. And uh, this utility is uh, unknown and uh, it's unobservable, but it can be approximated with a model. So here usually we, we have this term B, which is called representative utility and some random error. And this representative utility is usually expressed with some uh, simple linear model. So for example, in the case of flights, it could be, for example, depending on the price and the trip duration. So uh, the most used model in this family of models, let's say, is called the MNL, Multinomial Login Model. This was proposed by a Nobel Prize winner, McFadden, uh, some time ago now. And uh, the idea is that given some assumptions where the, the error is gamble and the alternatives are independent, uh, we can express the probability of a user choosing a given choice, a yeah, given alternative with this equation here that depends now not on, on the unobservable utility, but on this V, which is the model, basically. So, uh, so this is the MNL model is widely used in the industry, in the, the travel industry, but also in other industries. And it's very fast, it has decent performance, and uh, it's simple to interpret because it's linear. But it has some disadvantages, let's say. So because it's linear, of course, let's say the, the accuracy suffers a little compared with other methods. And uh, it also has some assumptions, like I said, uh, specifically the, uh, the independence of the alternatives and of the individuals. And what we observe in practice is that it, for, for it to work well, we usually require to have different models for, for example, different markets. So for example, different origin destinations or different groups of users. So for example, business or leisure travelers and so on. And it also sometimes requires some feature, manual feature engineering. Uh, so what we propose is to improve this using deep learning, and specifically pointer networks. Now, maybe you're not familiar with this, so I'm going to cover a little bit uh, pointer networks and the two uh, mechanisms that which is based on, which is sequence to sequence and the attention mechanism. So the idea of pointer networks is like by combining the sequence to sequence and attention mechanism to target problems where the outputs are discrete and correspond to positions in the input. Okay. Uh, sorry. <laughs> so first of all, sequ what's sequence to sequence? Okay. So this is a typical uh, neural architecture where we have a decoder, an, an encoder, and a decoder, as you can see there. It's a diagram taken from the original paper. Um, and the idea is that the encoder receives this uh, sequence, which can be variable length, and sort of like embeds it into a space of a fixed length vector. 
Okay? So the encoder will be the A, B, and C there. And then the decoder, he takes this, uh, this vector and he starts the, re re producing an output sequence, again, variable length. And he will be writing the sequence until the end of sequence character is uh, produced. And then it's the, the process is over. And this here are the equations like, um, that, the, that the model uses. So basically, the G and the F would be the equations of the, for example, if you implement this with an RNN, it can be an LSTM or something else. So these would be the equations governing that type of cells. And the C here, usually in the simplest model, in the original one, for example, the C would be equal to the last state of the encoding. So that's what the decoder receives in the first time step. And this was later improved using what is called the attention mechanism. So here the idea is that to connect the encoder and the decoder and to, uh, in a specific way, and instead of like the decoder having only access to the last uh, encoding state, so now he would be using adaptively as it's decoding. He would be looking at the entire sequence of encoding uh, states and using like a weighted sum of them. So that's what we see here in the top uh, left, right, sorry. And uh, basically these weights, which are normalized, are computed using a compatibility function between the, deco the actual decoding state and the encoding states. And the equations here, they're very similar to the ones before. It's just that now C is this weighted sum of the encoding states. This, uh, they're normalized using the softmax, and uh, this u vector is computed using this compatibility function between the decoding state and the, all the previous encoding states. And in the original paper cited over there, this is just the a function is just uh, like a fully connected layer. It's a simple one, but it can be more complicated. It depends on the application, let's say. And this was originally proposed for like um, translation. So they were translating text from English to French, from French to English. Now, in the, when you have a sequence to sequence with the attention mechanism, the size of the output dictionary and of the input dictionary is fixed a priori. So for example, in the original paper, they were translating phrases. So the input dictionary would be, for example, the top 20,000 or 50,000 English words, and the output would be the top 20 or 30 or 50,000 French words. But this is not really directly applicable to problems where the output dictionary depends on the length of the input sequence. So this is what the pointer networks do. They adapt the attention mechanism to create pointers to elements in the input sequence. So for example, the idea is here represented in the original paper in the diagram. You, you still have the encoder and the decoder. Only the, now the decoder, instead of being uh, producing a sequence, it will be pointing to different elements. So in the original paper, they, for example, they sort sequences of numbers. So the idea would be the encoder receives the original, let's say, list of real numbers, and the decoder will try to point to the, or sorry, to, the, to, the to the elements and sort in them. Okay. And uh, so what we did was to, to adapt this to our problem. So as I said before, we have the user that he has he's presented with certain alternatives, and there's only one which is chosen. So what we do is basically we feed the this, the sequence of alternatives to the encoder. We will receive this vector that encodes the session, let's say, and then we can sort of like train the, the network to be able to point to the one that's most likely going to be chosen by the, by the user. So in our case, we only have one chosen, and the, 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 the guy bought one ticket, right? So we don't really need to have this output sequence, so we don't really need to have an RNN decoder. So we simplify that and we put a, a fully connected layer. And uh, we can also simplify the computation of the, the matching between the decoder and the encoders. So we, we simplify the equation over there. And also because now we have these itineraries which have, let's say, more complex uh, features, so like categorical and numerical, not just a list of numbers. So we add like a pre-processing layer with embeddings and normalizations. And basically that's the idea. We feed the itinerary uh, for each user and it will point to the most likely being chosen. So to, uh, to validate this, we, we created a real data set that combines Erlang bookings and search logs. So for the Erlang bookings, what we have are PNRs, so personal name records, which are used in the travel industry whenever a travel reservation is made. So it can be a plane or it can be a hotel or a train or whatever. And this, uh, this type of records, they contain the travel itinerary, um, the entire travel itinerary for the traveler. So we have the origin, the destination, the dates, the airline, that's just some basic information, let's say. And in some cases, we can have additional information such as the age, the gender, the nationality, and stuff like that. And then on the other hand, we have the search logs. So in this case, what we have are like requests on our systems of people looking for, for a given flight. 
and we also have the, the answers that we gave them, okay? So by combining these two like, uh, data sets, we're able to generate this data set that contains what the person was looking for, the alternatives that he saw, and the final choice. Now the problem is that this, uh, this matching is not really perfect because there's no direct link between both uh, data sets. There's no like an ID that we can share and so on. And also the booking and search times differ a little bit, right? Because we also we start looking and then we, we buy. But uh, we can still use some of the things in common, such as the origin, destination, the date, a little bit the time, the what is called the office ID. So it's like the travel agency that the person used to book. And also on the other hand, we have, for example, the IP. So we know the country with that, where he booked and so on. And we can match and, re and create this data set that will have this uh, numerical and uh, categorical features. Some which are shared between the itineraries. So the origin, the destination, of course, the date maybe. Uh, others will, will, de will be depending, for example, the price, the trip duration, the airlines, and so on. What we do is we sort these alternatives by ascending price. And in the data set that we use for these experiments, we have around 34,000 people. Uh, with a maximum of 50 alternatives per session, and uh, this covers 35 uh, medium haul uh, European markets. Mm -hmm. So for the for the validation, we used uh, three metrics, three KPIs. So the top N accuracy, which is defined like classically. Um, we also calculate the the airline market share, the predicted one. And we also take a look at the percentage of the sessions where the real choice was in the top 15 alternatives, but the predicted one was after the 15 alternatives. Now this 15 is a little bit uh, taken, um, like uh, there's no real rule for this. Uh, the idea is that, uh, for example, in, if when you go to uh, know, Kayak or any search engine like that for flights, usually they will, show, they will show you 15 alternatives or around. So the idea is to, 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 pre to, to minimize the cases where the where we would have shown the, the one that he actually chose, the user, in the second web page where usually no one goes. And um, we compare this, uh, the performance of our model against uh, MNL, so the one I explained before, and what we call the machine-based learning based, um, based method and some basic heuristics. So in the, for the machine learning based methods, the idea is pretty simple. So we forget about this notion of, uh, of session, of user session and so on. So we just treat each line like an independent observation, which will have a label zero one one if he was chosen or not. And then we just train a classifier, in our case, a gradient boosting tree. Uh, we get the probability of being chosen, basically. And then we re reassemble these sessions, and we normalize, again, the probabilities, because otherwise they would not add to one. And this is the method that we use. And then the, the heuristics are very simple. Uh, we always predict that the user is going to choose the cheapest one or the shortest one. There's are two different ones. So uh, just some results. So this is, the, let's say, the main result. So this is the top N accuracy for the compare methods. So the one in the bottom, there are the heuristic ones. And the, the red one is ours. So as you can see, the ours is consistently better throughout N. And now when we zoom in, so we can see, for example, uh, top one and top five accuracy. So here ours, of course, is better. Uh, and you can see, well, the difference is quite considerably for MNL, uh, not that much for, for ML. But uh, still, like, uh, what we see is that even a small increase in this accuracy can lead to like, significant increase in profit in certain cases. For, for example, if an airline knows that uh, some, some flight is going to likely be selected, they can maybe increase the price slightly. And if you still choose it, then they will, they will be making more money out of it. And uh, so for the other metric, again, we see that uh, in this case is the percentage of sessions that have the real choice in the top 15, but predicted afterwards. The idea is to have the, the percentage to be slow, uh, small. So again, we, we outperform the other two. And like I said here, the idea is to like, uh, not place in the, the chosen alternative in the first page could, we, we could uh, lead to like, lower conversion rates. So that's, of course, bad. Um, so here's just the, the market share for the airlines. So the airlines are anonymized. Uh, the real one is in black and ours is in red. So as you can see, it's ours matches better the, the real uh, distribution. And uh, having a good market share estimation is important for, for certain applications in the industry, like, uh, for example, predicting the, the potential impact of a new flight or a new route, and so on. And uh, just to wrap it up, 
So the problem was uh, that we're trying to solve is that uh, travel providers are interested in knowing and understanding how passengers choose between alternative itineraries. And this can be used for different uh, commercial applications. And uh, usually this problem has been tackled in the industry using discrete choice model, in particular MNL. And uh, we propose to try to improve this using deep, uh, deep learning, and in particular pointer networks, which is a framework that combines sequence to sequence with a modified attention mechanism and is able to learn to point to the alternative that's most likely being chosen by the user. And uh, this was evaluated using a real data set that combines online search logs with the airline bookings, with PNRs. And we compare the performance against the classical MNL and uh, machine learning based methods. And our method outperforms the, this, the other models in terms of top end accuracy and other business related uh, metrics. And the model, comparing mostly with MNL, we see that our method is non-linear and uh, there's no statistical independence assumption about the alternatives. And what we see in practice is that we don't require a previous data segmentation or, or feature, engineering, feature engineering by hand. And I was a little quick, sorry, but uh, thank you. <laughs>